have Dr. Simon Singla with me on the Arthritis Life podcast today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yay. Um, can you just let the audience know a quick introduction to you? Like, where do you live and what's your relationship to arthritis? Yeah. So m- my name is Dr. Singla and I am a pediatric rheumatologist in Houston, Texas. Um, I have a three school-aged children and I'm also a wife. So a little bit of a busy life over here. Um, Houston is my home. I, I grew up here. Um, the only three years I really left Texas was when I did my three years of general pediatrics in Chicago at the University of Chicago. So the weather was a slightly different than Houston, Texas, um, but it was fun. It was fun living that life. You know, it was before we had children, my husband and I, my husband is also from Houston. My last year of residency is when we had our first child. Um, So that was about 10 years ago now. And at that time, we kind of made a decision like, gosh, either we stay here and, you know, put down roots here or move back down to Houston where family is. So I was in the middle of applying for fellowship for pediatric rheumatology fellowship at that time. And so interviewed at a bunch of places in Texas and ended up matching at um, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Um, And so, you know, it was very exciting. We all decided to move back down and it was another three years of training to complete that uh, fellowship. And after that fellowship, I stayed on as faculty at um, Texas Children. So it was, and then I became an attending rheumatologist, which is just the fancy name for grown up doctor. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's so many stages. And I think um, when people, patients go from seeing a pediatric rheumatologist to an adult rheumatologist, I think that it it can be a rude awakening sometimes because the people that self-select into being pediatricians are a little different, right? (laughs) That's right. Adult room. Do adult rheumatologists go through internal medicine first and then special? Okay. That's what I thought. I just want to make sure. Yes. Our roads are similar, but a little bit different. You have to do three years of general medicine for them. It's internal medicine for us. It's general peds. Our fellowship is three years after that. Mm -hmm. Their fellowship is two years of adult rheumatology. Oh, that's funny. Less time. It's okay. just the way it is. Some programs yeah. are three years for them, but for the majority, it's two. Okay, great. Okay. Well, and then the, the, an interesting thing about your journey is after you became a pediatric rheumatologist, you had a personal experience with rheumatology as a patient. Can you that's tell right. us a little about that? Yes. The plot thickens. So I am just living my life as a adult room or pediatric rheumatologist as an adult, right at this point and minding my own business. And then all of a sudden I start to get stiffness in my fingers, uh, fatigue, just pain. And I'm like, gosh, this feels a little bit inflammatory, but let's just ignore it because I'm working. I'm a new, you know, attending doctor. I'm just busy. A few months go by and I'm, it's getting worse. The fatigue is kind of like cutting into my days. At this point, I've also had a second child. So I'm thinking it's motherhood, you know, all that kind of stuff. And like any good medical practitioner, I don't have a PCP. I don't, I don't have someone to refer me. That's a P- so- PCP is primary care provider. In right. The US. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no. So I'm like, what do I do? And um, it came to a point where I'm like, I really should see somebody to figure out what's going on. And I actually reached out to one of my adult colleagues and I was like, listen, it's probably nothing. Can you just, you know, fit me in? And, and that's a privilege in itself to be able to call up somebody and get a spot because for most people, a new patient visit takes about three months to get in. And so here I am on the poor doctor's lunch break and I'm walking in, you know, trying to get a new patient spot and she examines me and she's like, you know, Simon, I think you have inflammatory rheumatoid arthritis. And I was like, excuse me, what, what did you say? <laughs> um, Cause I really was in denial. I was like, there's no way it could be rheumatoid arthritis, right? Like I'm doing this day in and day out. How do I miss it in myself? Wow. Well, and there's also, isn't, what do they call it? Like, um, medical student syndrome where like, you think you have every condition. The hypochondriac. Yeah. Yeah. I hate that word. Sorry. So I'm like, trigger yeah. warning. no, I don't believe that really. Yeah. I think that's extremely rare to truly be a hypochondriac. I do right. think that when people are anxious about things, it's usually them trusting their body, but right. yeah, but the, but the syndrome, the quote unquote, yeah, the syndrome of the medical students is every time you learn about a new condition, you start being like, oh, wait a minute, that right. could be me. So I definitely have that cross my mind. And then throughout the diagnosis, 
you kind of, this is the first time I've ever become a patient other than my OB care. Right. So I, I'm just like sitting on the other side, kind of flabbergasted by what she just said. And on top of that, I think the delivery of the diagnosis was caught me off guard because she was like, listen, this is a run of the mill diagnosis in the world of rheumatology. And I think she was trying to kind of connect with me as a colleague, like, don't worry, this is not that big of a deal. We're going to get this. But for me, I couldn't get past like, this is what you have. And then I walked out of there feeling like, gosh, she just, I feel like a disease that just came in like any other person into the clinic. You know, I'm not a person that has this diagnosis. I'm just this diagnosis for her in her 1230 spot. And, and that's when I was just like, is this how I've made patients feel? Is this how, is this what I've done to families before? Because it's not a good feeling at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I really, I empathize with you and I think it's hard because I think I'm wonder, obviously I don't know this, this doctor, but I wonder if sometimes people try to minimize the condition to try to comfort you to say, right. don't freak out. Like, don't think that your life is over. Like this is like you said, a run of the mill, but mm-hmm. then it ends up making you feel like they're not um, taking it so seriously, taking seriously the impact this is going to have on your life and your career. Exactly. exactly. Because on the flip side, she has to see like 12, 15 patients a day, more than that. And so I, she just, she doesn't remember me, right? Like in my experience, but for me, this is like 30, 45 minutes of my entire day. That is life-changing news. Mm-hmm. So when you start looking at it the other way, you're like, oh, wow, this is a pretty impactful moment in this person's life. It's um, huge. It's, I mean, I actually didn't, I, I didn't know how many patients rheumatologists saw in a day because in, in occupational therapy, our visits are 55 minutes, usually unless it's acute care when they're shorter, right. but like I've always worked in outpatient or school-based actually in school-based they're shorter sometimes, but anyway, in mm-hmm. outpatient clinics, you see a maximum of eight people a day, unless you're doing like a 10 hour, but you know, so even that that's, you at least have time to answer people's questions in an hour you know, appointment, but then thinking about having to deliver this kind of information day in, day out, like 12 times a day. Right. Right. Like I can't, or, I mean, it's, I know a lot of times patients, we do like to vent, you know, and Mm -hmm. say like, Oh, I wish I had more time. I wish my doctor was better, you know, but also like, there's all these system things like systemic issues with healthcare, where it's like, Anyway, there's reasons why things aren't better, but doesn't it's an explanation, not an excuse, right? Right, right. But this is so eye-opening, right? Because all of a sudden, instead of like compartmentalizing the care, I'm taking like a third eye point or bird's eye point of view and just kind of looking at the whole situation and be like, Shh, I'm patient number six out of the day for her. For me, this is my medical care and this is not the diagnosis I was expecting. So kind of like, you kind of start to realize the interplay of everything. And like you said, this is system-wide issues that exist in giving and being able to deliver good care. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have so many like follow-up questions, but (laughs) so how old was your second child when you got your diagnosis? He was, I think about nine months old, like just under a year. And that's a common postpartum to flare. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and you have the, like most people have a delay in diagnosis if it's Mm -hmm. postpartum, even though it's more common because it is also, it's common for rheumatoid arthritis to first appear postpartum, but it's also common for people without rheumatoid arthritis to have joint changes right. you know, during pregnancy and postpartum right. and pain and overuse, you know, right. I which is what I thought it was, which is why I was like, yeah. it's nothing. <laughs> When you have a toddler and a little baby, so yeah. you're probably, you know, you're care- probably having to pick up the toddler. And yeah. um, so I'm, I are, I'm, I immediately am thinking to myself, okay, what, um, because I know you have three kids. So I'm mm-hmm. curious what, uh, I mean, again, I, I also want to ask about your treatment for yeah. RA, but I, I, I can't stop myself from asking. So what, uh, how did that, how, what was it, what was your pregnancy like prior to RA versus your third child when you did have RA? That's a very good question because my pregnancy was so uneventful the first and second time. And the third time I was just hit with so much fatigue and stiffness and swelling that it was just, I was like, is this pregnancy or is this the arthritis? I cannot tell the difference between what is what, but most people have a different experience where their arthritis goes into control or into partial remission, at least during the pregnancy. And for me, I had the opposite experience. 
I'm so sorry. Yeah, I I was the, one of the lucky ones. Like I was teaching swing dance classes oh, like wow. seven months pregnant. Like wow. I was like, woohoo. <laughs> but um, but then the postpartum was all flare right. was the worst. But but so but it's so yeah, you, oh, and you have two kids you're taking care of and you're trying to work. Oh my yes. gosh. I you know, it's just ignorance is bliss where you're like, it's okay, this is normal, this is all normal. Right. <laughs> it's part of pregnancy. And then the postpartum, you know, after I had my third one the arthritis really got bad. And mm. honestly, since that time, which was now four years ago, I've had a very rocky road trying to get my arthritis under control I'm and then so throw in like the COVID vaccines to cause flares here and there, mm. you know, it's all been kind of a roller coaster since then. I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I can really, I know a lot of people listening can, can relate to that. And so, yeah, what are some of the, uh, if you're, if you're comfortable sharing, mm-hmm. what are some of the treatments that you've um, that you've tried. And I know right. that you've delved into integrative rheumatology. I would love to learn a little bit more yeah. about that too. Absolutely. So my, my, the first meds I started, I think were Plaquenil steroids. We just did a real conservative approach to see if that would kind of, um, treat it at least. And it didn't, I tried that combo for about six months, just low dose steroids and Plaquenil, let the Plaquenil kick in, um, still with a lot of stiffness. So she put me on, um, I believe my first medication was Humira every two weeks. Um, she didn't want to do methotrexate because I we I was postpartum and breastfeeding and stuff. So that was out of the question. But uh, Humira, I had an allergic reaction to. Like my face just oh, blew up. <laughs> and this was like so months sorry. into the months into the treatment, you know? So um, oh, you've been on it that. for multiple weeks and then you had an allergic yes. reaction. Oh, yes. So, so somehow I had sensitized myself to it. And then I woke up with like swollen lips and eyes the day after my injection. Oh, um, gosh. and I, as a rheumatologist know that that's also a very rare side effect of the medication. So I'm like, could this, did I eat something? Did I, it's almost like more knowledge is not helpful in this situation. <laughs> 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 oh no, you're dashing my dream that if I was a rheumatologist, I would just know everything. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Quite the opposite. Yeah. Oh, um, and no. then I got switched to Embril and Embril actually worked for me for a few number of years up until my third pregnancy. I mean, I was like, I feel so good. This is, I mean, like, this is great. And then kerplunkety, like I got pregnant with the third one and oh, just no. flared and um, that was difficult. And since then, I've been on Orencia, I've been on Simzia, I've been on Rinvoke. Um, what else have I been on? Um, Ectemra. I mean, you name it, it's, I've tried it. And so right now my combination is Simzia and methotrexate as of recent. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. That yeah. is a lot. And you're, how old is your youngest? He's three and a half, three now. Okay. Three okay. Now. okay. Wow. I know. I just, I really, I empathize with the postpartum whack-a-mole kind of of trying to get your symptoms and I was really stubborn I wanted to stay on Remicade because I kept thinking it was going to work again right (laughs) I don't know why I was like attached to that medicine you're like yes I don't want to change I don't like change so we were like okay the Remicade first was every eight weeks let's do it every six weeks and every four weeks and let's increase and we got to the point where it was the most it could be with my body weight or whatnot and then we were like it's just not working anymore but um but but anyway sorry back to back to your journey. Um, yeah, that's we've all had similar journeys where you're like, hopeful, sad, hopeful, sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and how did you learn or, or when, I mean, when did you even have time to learn about integrative medicine during all of this? <laughs> so or what, it, first of all, what is integrative medicine? Yeah. Don't know. yeah. R- right. Right. So yeah. Integrative medicine is the specialty of medicine that combines conventional or Western medicine with more complementary slash Eastern medicine. And when I say Eastern medicine, it's not just throwing like Chinese herbs and acupuncture and Ayurveda at whatever. It's evidence-based therapies for specific illnesses. So these are supported by the National Institute of Health for certain conditions. So you can have acupuncture for headaches, low back pain, things like that. Um, just because I felt like I, the reason I pursued integrative medicine is because number one, all my patients asked about it and they were like, well, what diet should I be on? What supplement can I take? Can I do this? And in our regular training, our traditional conventional training, no one talks about this because there isn't enough data to support the use of X, Y, or Z. Right. And so integrative medicine kind of came up on my radar because a patients were asking me about it and B I had those same questions. 
as a patient. So I was like, let me, let me look into this and how I can answer this for my patients. And initially I wanted to do like, like a webinar on it. And then I like went into a rabbit hole online on more about integrative medicine and decided to pursue a, a fellowship in it, which is two extra years of training, which is like a drop in the bucket at this point. I was like, I can do that. <laughs> So I, I signed up for that. I applied for that fellowship through the Andrew Weil Integrative um, Medicine Program at the University of Arizona um, and just about to finish that this summer and next month. So uh, wow. that gave me more of kind of a broader perspective on what to recommend based on evidence. And it's I'm not saying these are randomized, double blinded, placebo controlled trials. It's just really hard in the world of integrative medicine, yeah. but at least there's enough evidence to say that this works and that probably doesn't. So let's not try that. Absolutely. I was just reviewing. Um, well, first of all, congratulations. Because I, <laughs> again, you. I'm like, I think anyone listening is like, how is she doing all this? Like having three know. kids and working. <laughs> oh, okay. You don't know. Okay. I People don't. ask me that. And I say, I don't know either. Um, but yeah. And that's doc the Dr. Wheel of uh, the fellowship in integrated medicine. This, for those who've listened to a lot of the episodes, it's the same one that Dr. Micah, you, mm -hmm. who also has, um, yep you know, a autoimmune um, diagnosis and he's an integrative rheumatologist. Um, he is on the same one. And, you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, or I was just reviewing the UCSF website, mm -hmm. like Osher Institute yes. for, and they have, they have randomized controlled trials that they've referenced um, for um, nutrition and diet right for rheumatoid arthritis, which yes. I found really, cause yeah, for so long, I, I, I kept hearing that line of like, there's not enough data. There's not, there's no, no one's doing any mm -hmm. high quality data. I'm like, wait a minute, people are, it's, it's changing, it's slowly changing. Yeah. And it's not just institutions that have integrative medicine kind of across the board. People are starting to look at diet and psoriatic arthritis. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a new article on psoriatic arthritis and diet and weight loss. You know, it's like no, every I'm, month. I'm choosing to put my head in the sand on that. One because <laughs> I'm like low calorie diet. Do not sign me on. I'd rather have arthritis. No, I'm Sorry, <laughs> don't say that. No, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Or like, it's like it's almost like it's like the intermittent fasting ones too, right. where I'm just like, I will not be doing this. Right. I, I will cope with my if my disease gets much worse, I will yeah. consider it. But yeah, we all have the right to kind of say like what we're willing to try for our quality of life and what we're not exactly. willing to try, right? And that's the importance of shared decision making when you have that doctor patient relationship. You know, you really need to talk through things and be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Just like I'm not going to do methotrexate because I don't want to, you know, blah blah blah. Like you, you have you're allowed to an opinion. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I was going to say, when you said shared decision-making, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it's, it's something that as a provider, I know what that means. And when I say provider, I just mean health provider. Right, I, know, right. I know I'm not a doctor, yeah. <laughs> by the way, those are, I'm an <laughs> occupational therapist. Um, but, um, but when we say shared decision-making, I think provider health providers know what that means, but patients may not know. So yeah. can you describe like, what does that mean? Sure. Yeah. Shared decision-making is where the doctor is not the only one running the show, right? Like they're going to give their expert advice, their opinion on what's going on. And you also have input in their decisions. So in their med, that means their medication choice, you know, when you want to wean, when you, I'm not saying dump the doctor's choices and uh, disregard what they're saying, you can have a conversation with them about, okay, what's the pros and cons of this? When can I get off of this? What do we do next? And so you make decisions on your treatment based on that conversation. Yeah. And that's really supposed to be the gold standard in, in rheumatology, right. you know, and, um, it, I feel like I, I, this is totally just a sense I've gotten. I'm curious of your opinion, but like, I feel like it's more common in pediatrics and not maybe as common in, in adult medicine. Yes. Yeah. Because parents want the best, which parent doesn't every parent wants yeah. the best for their child, right? You want to minimize the amount of meds and side effects. So that they're going to question everything you have to say, which is not bad as a doctor, you need to be able to come back and answer those questions. They're real concerning questions. What right. is the long, what is the long-term effect of this medication? And, and as a physician, you really have to say like, listen, we don't know the details of this, but what we do know is X, Y, and Z. And so based off of that uncertainty or whatever we know, we have to move forward with the decision. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it's, it, it really is a relationship that you mm -hmm. develop with your provider, which is why I always encourage people 
if they have enough providers in that area, which I know for pediatric rheumatology in particular is not a luxury everyone has, but to, you know, get a second opinion. And I just had someone in the support group, the room to thrive group I'm facilitating Mm -hmm. who said, I'm so glad if I took that, I was, I was annoyed at having to take the time to find a second opinion, but I did, or just interviewed a different rheumatologist. And they're like, I'm so much happier now, you know? So it's, it's going to be a relationship you have for a long time with your doctor. So exactly. In the world of pediatrics, it's pretty much your entire childhood. And then you go on to an adult rheumatologist. Yeah. Yeah. But, but back, I I know uh, my listeners are very interested in like, basically the way I put it very simply is like, all the tools in our toolbox. Like, Mm -hmm. tell me all the tools that you could possibly, you know, use on a daily basis to help manage your condition. So what are some of the tools? Let's just start with integrative medicine. Like what are some of the interesting things you found help with RA? It's been a trial and error process, but the four main things I would say that I always come back to, which are kind of the pillars of integrative medicine is going to be nutrition, your sleep, exercise and mind body therapies. So those are key. And I would say everyone has a different level of importance to those four. For me, sleep is actually number one by far. If I don't get good sleep, I am not only cranky, my joints hurt and I'm achy. Um, You know, naps help a little bit, but I need my eight to 10 hours, which is really hard when you're a mom of three with a full-fledged career, you know? So I actually put an alarm on at the end of the day for when to go to bed, just like I do when I get up, because it's really easy to keep watching those shows (laughs) on Netflix. (laughs) Totally. And I'm the same. It's really, I I think right when you said like the four things, you know, the four tools, nutrition, sleep, exercise, and mind body, it immediately had this idea of like a pie chart where you can show like for one patient, it's like nutrition is their main pillar is like, you know, takes up half of the pie chart for someone else, it's sleep, you know, so discovering that for yourself exactly. is so important. Exactly. And how do, you, how do you protect your sleep? Cause I, 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 there's a joke in my family that I'm a sleep diva. <laughs> like, like there's and, nothing and, wrong with that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to get t-shirts made. Like I was just talking about that in some of my other interviewees, but, um, uh, like, and one of the ways that, that I, I mean, from a young age, Charlie has known that like sleep is important for mom and like if that right. means he needs to be on the iPad for like an hour while I take a nap, but I don't, I'm not going to feel guilty about that. You know, but that's I know right. a lot of people who are moms feel, you know, so how, how have you protected your sleep? Um, I think it's been a learning curve. Just like you, I had a lot of mom guilt. Like I need to get up before the kids so I can do my thing, you know, have breakfast ready. It's just going to make my day easier, but it's not, it's not easier. I just am more tired starting the day. Um, so what I've done is like you, we've told our kids, like, do not get up this at this time I we expect you to play keep yourself busy just don't hurt yourself you know they're kind of older now so this is a real possibility versus before where it was more like okay the only thing I can do is just go to bed early (laughs) and wake up when they wake up but now we will have like family movie nights on Friday and Saturday so it goes pretty late like 10 o'clock for them is really late um and so they know that do not wake mommy up at 6.30 in the morning on Saturday, (laughs) because this is her time to rest. And so we've set boundaries with that. And consistency is key because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, But for the most part, they're really great. And then my husband also has been super supportive when we've just been kind of trialing an error, what works, what doesn't. And so if I'm tired, he's like, you sleep in, I'll get the kids. I mean, they'll have cereal with sugar for breakfast, but I really have zero control at this point. (laughs) You have to choose your battles. And right. what I love is that you're modeling self-care to your children. You're modeling that you, that you are worth investing your time, right, right. Into taking care of yourself. And that's a mindset that you kind of really have to slip into. It's not anything that I think we're born with. I think it's like, you just work hard. You do what you need to. You're there for everybody else. Right. But then on the, I've seen on the flip side, what happens when I'm not well, I'm cranky. Uh, Everybody else is just cranky because I'm cranky. Um, You know, work is just hard. It's sluggish. You slug through the day and that's not healthy for anybody. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And um, what about for you or what are some of the things that you found helpful for nutrition on the nutrition um, and exercise? 
Yeah. So area. nutrition is just an overwhelming part of the pie. Like you mentioned, yeah. because there's just like, you do this diet, cut that out, eat this food. And you're like, if any of these were the magic, you know, equation to fixing my arthritis, why are there so many of them? <laughs> <laughs> I said the exact same thing before, or I'm also like, you know, I went, I've been gluten-free for over a decade. It hasn't had any effect that I've noticed on my RA, but right. it's helped my stomach. And I know theoretically everything's interconnected, you know, right, so but right. anyway, yeah, but other people are like, oh my gosh, I cut out gluten and I have zero joint pain, like right. zero. And so and it's that's worth amazing. A try. Yeah. It, it is worth a try. I think it's the symptom tracking is where this comes in. And I know you've taught um, others on how to do that. So that's really important. I actually didn't start that till about a year ago and I've had arthritis for many, many years now. And so when you start to track your symptoms and your, I just give my stiffness a number in the morning. And then, so if the number goes up from the day before, I can see like, what did I do differently? And for me, I cut out gluten. It didn't really make a big difference. Thank God. So I'm back to eating gluten, you know, <laughs> I can enjoy my pastas and my bread. Um, there are certain foods like wine triggers it, you know, that's not really a food, but wine triggers it's a food to some people. <laughs> <laughs> red wine will trigger it or um just certain like certain meats i don't i've cut down on meats the more vegetables and fruits i eat the better which intuitively makes sense right like we're right. humans and that's kind of what we've evolved with so right right yeah i know that's that's super helpful um i know that um yeah i know that a lot of people are just very overwhelmed like you said with nutrition right. so i think I liked your idea of starting, you know, or maybe I'm putting these words in your mouth, but like starting small and just tracking. Yeah, that's hey, right. That's you know. right. Because if you do too many changes at the same time, you won't know what's what, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not a big fan of the elimination diet. I just, I can't do that with the way my life works. Like if I'm in clinic, I can't really... I don't have like food options to right. not a huge meal prepper. When I do, I'm great. But when I, it's not consistent at all. Right. Or if we're out with right. friends, the social aspect of it is really hard to stay on track with uh, elimination diet. So I just track my symptoms and work backwards. That, and that, that seemed to work for sense. me. And what about exercise? Yeah. So for me, I have to have some sort of movement, right? Uh, yoga is very helpful because I think it helps stretch the joints. Uh, I am actually, I love running. Uh, but, and I used to run on high incline before I realized it's not so great on my knees. And so now I'm back to normal. So I'll just do like a mile, a mile and a half. And then I'm big on weights because I know that's a lot of strength training is great for bones and, and building up the strength in the bones. So I tend to focus on resistance training, yoga, and then running when I can. That's great. That's great. Yeah. And I think that you just, to me, whenever I teach people about the basics of self-management, I always say, yeah, there's the three, the three pillars for exercise for rheumatoid arthritis and related diseases are like stretching, strengthening, and cardio. So exactly. you just, there you go. All, all I didn't three know I was those. doing that. <laughs> you are. You check that off the list. Yeah. Yeah. And the strength training is really good because we're also people with RA are more prone to like um, muscle wasting, mm -hmm. you know, and especially exactly. with uncontrolled disease. So um, and it just feels good. It feels it to me, it feels good to have like some cardio, actually the cardio is what feels the best to me, but, but, um, I also do, I like the feeling of having a little bit more muscle. It makes it more, your body move more efficiently. So it actually right. cuts down on fatigue, which is un, it's like unintuitive to some people, right? right. Cause they're like, what? I have to like exert energy to feel like more and <laughs> what? <laughs> like, exactly. What yeah. But, um, and then mind body, I'm really curious again, cause you seem like, at least as we're talking, like mentally resilient, <laughs> cause I'm just <laughs> like, I can't even, like, I have one child and that's a lot, you know? So, oh, and I'm not you. working as a doctor all day. Yeah. So I'm like, how, what are you, you <laughs> what's know, your secret? Mind, I didn't know what mind body therapies were until I entered the world of integrative medicine. So that's basically taking care of your mental health, right? That whether that's journaling, that's meditating, using guided imagery at night, um, there's so many ways that you can address your mental health. And the problem with mind body therapies is that there is zero instant gratification with it, right? You sit down to meditate and you have this, what we call monkey mind. And you, I end up with like more to-do lists after my meditation than before, <laughs> but that's actually a myth. Like over time, you start to kind of calm your brain and just be in the moment of taking those deep right. breaths, feeling the cold air going into your nose, the warm air coming out. You start focusing on those small little feelings rather than, oh my God, I need to finish this and call this person and do this. It's that's, that will happen. That's the rest of your day. But for now, focus on what's happening in front of you. 
Um, I love so- that. That's been, that's probably the biggest piece of my pie of my, right. you know, daily management. Well, I guess it fluctuates, right? It mm-hmm. changes depending on, um, depending on how my condition is and what's going on externally, you know, in my, in my life context, um, there's obviously external stressors. Like we were, we renovated a house and moved mm-hmm. this year, you know, those yeah. at those times that was, you know, stressful. So yeah, I'm, and, and that really affects, you know, in stress is very inflammatory. Mm-hmm. So if you oh, can yes. manage your stress and, um, it's super, super helpful. And yeah, for me, I was w- joked before when I didn't understand what mindfulness and meditation were, I was like, I'm the, I would be the worst at that because like, I'm not, I'm like a high energy person, but it is like, it's about what the, what, the thing that resonated with me when I learned about it was like becoming the observing self. So you're not just the self have, you know, walking through your life, exactly. you're observing it. And so you can be observing, like if I'm taking a moment to like sit and just think, observe my thoughts, those thoughts could still be scatterbrained, right? They could right. be like, what's going on for dinner tonight, right. but I'm taking a moment to observe it. And then in certain kinds of meditation, yeah, then you bring your focus back to your breath. And other times you just say, I'm just going to be in the moment and watch my brain think thoughts and exactly. not judge them and not say they're good or bad and just allow them. It's so right. weird. But- People think you just have to kind of turn off your brain when you meditate. And that's such a myth because the goal is to kind of just be present. And like you said, take that bird's eye view of everything that's going on around you. So you're not so reactive to the world. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have like a formal routine with that? I, um, you know, every morning I'll, I'll wake up and just do like a quick six minute meditation. I'm not even aiming for 15, 20 minutes. That's a lot. I do. That's great. That's more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, something is better than nothing. Exactly. So um, I have one song that I listen to that I've listened to for the past two years and it's just music. <laughs> and I, I basically f- go through a certain um, kind of like a schedule of thoughts that I have to force myself into being, into thinking about compassion, gratitude, um, innate harmony. Um, I think about being a healing presence to people. Uh, I have gratitude, I think I said, as well as um, unconditional love just for others, family members. So I kind of walk myself those th- through those elements and then kind of feel better by the end of those six minutes. So I'm not already like, I'm late, you know? Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> did you learn that somewhere or did you just yes, develop so- it yourself? I kind of tweaked it, but it's something I learned through the fellowship and I'm, oh. I'm happy to teach that to others, but it's called the heart chakra meditation. Oh, and okay. it, it's supposed to kind of make you more intuitive with the world, what's going on around mm-hmm. you. So, because I think all of us are very me centric, right? That's normal. <laughs> You're like, I'm late, I'm this, I'm that, but like, there's so much going on around us. And so it helps you be more interconnected. I love that. It reminds me a lot of, I, self-compassion. I know it's more than that because you're talking about gratitude too, and like connecting to like being a healing presence, but with self-compassion, what's this funny irony about it is it's about taking a moment to provide yourself the compassion, like that you would provide a friend, but also at least the part of the practice that I've learned through, um, Kristen, Dr. Kristen Neff, a psychologist Mm -hmm. who does a lot of research on self-compassion and teaches about it is that you're also connecting to the fact that like all humans have suffering, you know, and all humans will go through suffering. So I am part of a group of, you know, a global population of people who suffer. It is not just me, you know, which can be on the one hand, I guess, depressing. (laughs) You're like, we all are suffering. Wait, this sucks. Or you could be like, okay, you know what? It's part of life. No, I think it's a powerful notion that you're just like, I'm like everybody else. You know, you are not immune. Nobody else is immune to this feeling. Yeah. 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 That's, that's how I look at it. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I realized I, I wanted to ask this earlier and, and forgot, but, um, what is in general, like, I think it's very fascinating for people to think about like, what it would be like to be a, not just a doctor and a patient. Cause there's people out there who are like, I'm a cardiologist and I have rheumatoid arthritis. You know, you have like a not related condition, although right. like, cardiology is <laughs> everything's interrelated, but, um, <laughs> but you know, um, like, what are some of the, I don't know, I just would love to hear your reflections yeah. on being both patient and doctor. You know, that's a great uh, question because I didn't even give my moment, the time, uh, like time in my life to reflect on that question until COVID when things kind of just finally slowed down, you know, so all of us had a second to breathe. Um, I think if I were to kind of look back at it, the one word that summarizes it is, is humbling. Like it's just very humbling 
to be a patient because in all of my training, all of the decades, decade of training that I've had, I think being a patient has taught me how to doctor more than anything else because you learn, you are basically in that person's head because you are that person. So that the same feelings of hopes and frustrations and fears I have as my patients and their parents, I'm just channeling it in a way where I can apply it. I, I have a sense of understanding of where they're coming from. So I don't dismiss feelings. I, if they don't want to do something, you know, I try to, instead of judging, kind of coming from a judgmental point of view, you are more like, okay, help me understand why you don't, because I think we both have the same fears. What is your biggest fear? Um, and so we kind of, I, I have that empathy angle much more than I did before this diagnosis. That, that makes complete sense. I mean, I, I, I wonder, I wonder if people are going to wonder, I wonder <laughs> if others will wonder, do you ever disclose to your patients that you have RA? You know, it's interesting that you asked that because for the first like few years, I never did. I was almost like ashamed of being like, gosh, I'm a rheumatologist and my arthritis is poorly controlled. What kind of doctor am I? Right. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of strength in being able to share my story. And then I started kind of realizing that every time a parent would be like, my child does not want to do this injection. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do mine either. <laughs> And I think that accidentally maybe came out one day. And that's when I first realized like, wait, you're on injections too. What do you do? Like, how do you handle it? If you're doing it, maybe I should be doing it too. You know, so there is strength in my perspective because I'm that person sitting there as well. Oh, absolutely. I know in, um, in occupational therapy school, we were taught like, what was it called? like limited self-disclosure or something where it's like yeah. therapeutic self-disclosure, like only disclosing something if you feel like it's in the best interest of the patient, right. which completely makes sense, <laughs> right? You're not going to be like, oh, right. I'm going to use this like 20 minute appointment to like process my own feelings, you know, exactly. <laughs> like that's, that's for therapy. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think it's really powerful. And I think also like one of the questions I get, one of the really basic questions is like, how do people put together a life with this condition, right? It's and a, just the fact yeah. that you're working, the fact that you're physically there. You know, it's been interesting road because my career has actually taken a pivot since mm -hmm. this diagnosis, since learning how to live with this diagnosis. Because when um, in my, I just recently left uh, a job at a, at a large children's hospital. Um, and one of the things that was really difficult for me was being on call because I told you sleep is critical for me. So when I was on call, I was getting paged overnight and I would wake up feeling froggy and, and tired. Right. And so that kind of went on every time that happened, I was on steroids every followed, it followed every single week I was on call. And so after a while you, you realize like, okay, I, this is a bleeding into my work life now. How am I going to manage this and maneuver being a mom and having a career? I didn't, I didn't want to quit. I mean, I'd worked so hard to get here. So that's kind of when the integrative medicine stuff, you know, bubbled in my head. And I thought, well, what if I can try to create a new type of practice where I do both rheumatology plus integrative medicine, we'll call it integrative rheumatology um, for kids and kind of start this new journey for me where I control my schedule, but I'm also able to deliver the type of care that I think my patients would want, you know, um, because I've been on their side, I've been in their shoes. No, that's, I mean, first of all, that, that's incredibly in inspiring. And it's definitely um, something that I think a lot of people end up with people with rheumatoid arthritis, you know, end up needing to rethink their job setting. May right. not, may, they may not need to rethink their entire career choice, but what setting is the best for my lifestyle? Right. And that is not an easy question to answer overnight because for me, I felt weak initially. I'm like, gosh, I'm not able to keep up with my peers. I'm trained just like them, but I can't do this service because it's affecting my health. Um, and that, if that weakness, that feeling is not great. And it took a while to kind of get over that I mean, whole thing. I, there's so many toxic beliefs in medicine, I think like, right. or, oh yes. From a young, like, or from, from early on in your, in what I've heard of, yes. you know, medical school, it's like everyone brags about how little sleep they got. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And now if I brag about it, I am not in a good place with my arthritis, right? Like right. you just have to kind of learn to put yourself first 
Because mm-hmm. how else are you going to help others if you can't help yourself? Like no, you're useless. Exactly. Right. And, and learning how to challenge those beliefs. And I know that I'm, I don't know everything in, in medicine, but I, I hear things on Twitter about, you know, it used to be people were on call for like 48 hours oh, or yeah. something. And oh, yeah. now it's like, they're starting to have more boundaries on that and limiting. I mean, no, there's still things are not there. Definitely the, the system for becoming a doctor is not kind oh, to people yeah. who have health issues. I, I, I agree. And uh, it's, it's kind of like a badge of honor if you're able to, you know, push through this 40 hour call and come back again in two days and do the same thing for three years straight. You know, it's when you're in the thick of it, you don't think twice, you just do it. You're like, this is what I need to do to get to my end point. But when you take a step back and realize that, is it affecting you in a bad way? You know, sometimes you can control it. Sometimes you can't like, if you're not going to graduate from residency, unless you put in that work, that's the reality of it. But on the other side, when you become this attending doctor and you become an adult, you're like, is this, is this what I want in life? Is this that, you know, is this yeah. kind of where I see myself for the next 15, 20 years? And it, and it's that sunken cost fallacy where sometimes you're like, well, geez, I just put so much time and money and effort into something. I don't want to like pivot away from it entirely. Right. But yeah, like it, I think it's really important to question those beliefs, whether that's in a, in a um, medicine career setting or law, you know, I have right. I had a, people on the podcast who are lawyers yes. or all sorts of careers. And yeah. And it's the same type of environment too, right? Mm-hmm, it's a, mm-hmm. you just put in the work, put your head down and don't make a squeak about how you feel. Yeah. It's so inhumane. It's just, yeah. and it's, it's just ironic that you were worried about being seen as weak when you are actually pushing through so much more pain and fatigue than the, than the other doctors who you were worried about judging you even know about, you know? Yeah. It's kind of that people pleasing. I don't even know what the complex is, but definitely (laughs) had it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly I I would say in my experience, I always like to be um, the, I like to be the exception, you know, like, (laughs) oh, well, other people couldn't do this, but Cheryl could, you know, so I was always like, oh, like I'm conquering rheumatoid arthritis. I know that there's a lot of like people who find inspiration in those kind of messages and totally, you know, whatever works for you works for you. But I do think that it's been helpful for me as my disease has progressed, you know, and I mean, mm-hmm. I've kind of had more ups and downs than initially to recognize that like, sometimes that's not the best thing is right. to, to push yourself so hard that you, you pay the price, you right. know, your health pays the price. You only have one life. Right. You exactly. Know? Exactly. And it is a trial and error process. I'm not saying like go into every job and be like, I need like X amount of sick days. You know, I think you need to know where your limit is. And once you yeah. figure that out, then you stick to it. Yeah. Yeah. You seem to be good at good, having good ability to do that. I'm like, oh, and you know, it's a work in progress. I'm yeah. not, I'm by no means perfect. I mean, I was on steroids yeah. every month I was on call. So yeah. <laughs> it took me a while oh, to learn. That's rough. that's rough. And actually I forgot to ask you this earlier, but I'm curious, um, what made you interested in pediatric oh. rheumatology in the first place? Right. <laughs> Yeah. So I, um, you have to kind of, it's a two-part decision, right? So first you decide to go into pediatrics and then you decide to go into rheumatology. So I didn't know from medical school that I wanted to do pediatric rheumatology. So in medical school, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon, so, but, but then that was one of my first rotations. I was like, Ooh, I don't think this, this is for me. Pediatrics was actually my very last rotation. And I love the feeling of being able to connect with families, uh, educate them, just that whole connection that you get. And then throughout residency, I realized I liked the chronic care. I know that a lot of people done. A lot of my colleagues went into like cardiology, ICU, the neonatal ICU. But for me, I love that long-term connection with families. I love the physical exam. I loved immunology. So it kind of all came together with pediatric rheumatology. That's wonderful. And, and there is a shortage. Like, so. yeah. So that is, there's, I think three, about 350 of us in North America. Um, they're working on, you know, working with Congress to try to increase more spots, try to maybe pay off loans for people who decide to go into the fellowship. There's different ways of going into it. But at the end of the day, any doctor who takes care of a child with chronic illness, there's going to be challenges involved um, and complex care in this case with diseases that not everybody has. There's not a lot of research. A lot of funding doesn't go into it. There's a lot of barriers to good care here. Well, and the, yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, yeah, I'm, oh, I always say like, 
I'm amazed that anyone wants to go in or I'm, I'm very um, grateful and in awe of anyone who wants to go into rheumatology in general, whether it's pediatric or adult, because I do feel like a lot, like what made me want to become an occupational therapist is helping people like overcome something and like Mm -hmm. you have a starting line, you have a finishing line. And even though actually it's a little more complicated than that, because I did actually want to work with um, developmental disabilities, which Mm. don't have a finish line, right? Right. They are a a chronic condition in the sense that they're, um, you know, they're something you're diagnosed with and they don't go away. But, um, but in, but in general, you can maybe have some like distinct leaps, like you didn't know how to do X, Y, Z, and then Mm -hmm. we taught you how to do X, Y, Z. Um, and, but with, so I think a lot of people who go into medicine, whether it's, you know, becoming a physical therapist or going into like real, you know, becoming a, I shouldn't say real, sorry, becoming like a doctor, yeah. doctor, doctor, um, medical doctor, um, they are motivated by the desire to, you know, fix a problem, right. you know, and be like, this is your heart doesn't work. I put a valve in it. Your heart works now. You're good. Right. Move on. Be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas in your case, it's like, you have this, you know, and so, I mean, I think it, it does take a totally different mindset to be like, we're going to, you know, it, you know, and can. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I didn't realize that going into rheumatology, you know, that <laughs> you told me that, um, oh, before, <laughs> but... I'm glad you didn't know, maybe you wouldn't have gone into much kidding. <laughs> yeah. but as a patient, I actually learned that, that yeah. it is so important to teach these children coming into our clinics that you are not going to get, it's not instant gratification. You are going to have to work to take your medicines, learn the names of, you know, the meds, when to take it, why you're here. And it is a journey. It is not a destination of like one to, you know, point A to point B. It is a journey that you're going to learn to navigate. You're going to have ups, you're going to have downs, but this is the reality of having a chronic illness. And it's a, it's a rude awakening for some right. people. Right. And that's why I think mental health care is so, so important to be done and congruent with, yes. you know, right. Cause with regular healthcare, because it's like, or with, you know, with the medical side, because it's like how, you know, I was, I try to make everything um, as simplified as possible. And so I actually made this chart once of like, what are the solvable problems and what are the unsolvable problems? Exactly. You can like, you know, sometimes like if I have stiffness, that's like more like mild, it might be like a partially solvable problem today. Cause I might be able mm-hmm. to say like, Oh, I can put on like this compression glove and that really reduces my stiffness and it's functional now. So that's like, okay, that's a little bit solvable, but then like the, there's all always with a chronic illness going to be some things that are not solvable. So learning right. to cope with that. And the control factor, I think we all want to have some sense of control, which is why yeah. people gravitate towards the supplements and the nutrition. Cause they're like, we can do that. We can control that part. But at the yeah. end of the day, your immune system is your immune system. So we're going to have to do our best to try to wrangle it in um, yeah. and fix it. Yeah. 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 It, I was going to also ask when we were talking about kind of, I was mentioning like the, I don't want to be too negative about the culture of medicine, but you know, this yeah. kind of culture overall of like pushing yourself and yeah. you know no one's allowed to complain like doctors are super tough doctors don't go to the doctor you know <laughs> right um, I know I'm guilty and I, yeah I know it's <laughs> it's so common um but I'm curious I didn't prepare you for this question so totally feel free to like pass <laughs> but I I've also had some people from like different cultural backgrounds like mm-hmm. I'm a white woman mm-hmm. <laughs> and um you know and I'm curious if like your cultural background has like affected like your experience of having chronic illness. That is a great question. I think, yes, it has because I'm Indian, um, Mm -hmm. South Asian. So I think when people have a chronic illness and it might not be generalized to the South Asian culture, don't get me wrong. But for me, I think when you have a chronic illness, it's more kept on the down low. It's not like this publicized thing, like, why are you talking about it? It's more like, just keep it on the low and then we'll try to figure it out. And by the way, you should probably be eating a gram, you know, of turmeric every hour and eating this. And there's like so many, so much input that everyone just loves to give. And so, because we're such a family oriented culture, right? Like grandparents and parents and this and that, but at the end of the day, I don't, for me, it wasn't an issue because I grew up here. So I was like, listen, there's no reason I need to hide what I have. I am going to start these medications and this is how it's going to be. And also I was so young when I was diagnosed, I was like in late twenties, early thirties. And people were like, you don't have that. You, that's something like my grandmother got, you know? And so mm-hmm. a lot of people are just also in denial of the whole thing. So it's kind of brushed under the table. You either 
keep it on the DL or you treat it like it's nothing. And so that was kind of hard for me. Yeah. And I, I had Saruthi on who she has started a nonprofit called Chronically Brown. Mm. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, she is a nonprofit working towards track, tackling the stigma of disability within the South Asian community. And yeah, she showed so many interesting insights. And again, there's no, I mean, there's a billion people in India yeah. <laughs> and, you know, a lot. So it's not like there's one mono, in monolithic culture, right. but um, I just, yeah, I wanted to hear, know your reflections on that because I have heard the same thing you were saying that, and you know, that it's a little bit like um, you don't, it's not, you know, invisible disabilities are even more invisible, or maybe there's like Correct. a stigma against talking about them. Right. And you're like, is it contagious an autoimmune disorder? Am I, is mm. if I marry you off to this person, are they going to get it? You know, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's not very, it's, um, and then maybe in, in general, you know, I think a lot of us struggle with it being seen as like a weakness, right. you know, exactly. and, um, and that's so- a good way to think about it. It's a weakness. It's not like a strength, you know, you carry around. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for showing about that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I also wanted to know in general, one of my favorite questions to ask my interviewees, um, whether they're, you know, a health provider or a patient, or in your case, both is, you know, what kind of words of wisdom do you find helpful to give to the newly diagnosed? Cause that's like the population yeah. so near, you know, to my heart. Is. I, you know, that is, it's good for, for new patients to hear these perspectives. Um, I think for me, it's don't have expectations on yourself and on the disease because everyone's course is different. What worked for someone might not work for you. You might be on seven biologics. You might be on one. I think it's normal to have hope coming out of that clinic visit, right? Like I really hope things are going to go well and to have optimism because that's also part of the mental health part of it to be optimistic, but be realistic. And so don't have expectations that my course is going to be X, Y, and Z, and then I'm going to be all good and never have to deal with this again, because I guarantee you there are going to be little bumps in the road. And if you have that notion that this shouldn't be happening, you're going to, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. That's so, I, I wish I had learned that. Cause I, when I got diagnosed, I was very lucky to have like kind of a best case scenario after my diagnosis, which is, you know, when I'm at the Trexate and Embril mm-hmm. went immediately into Medicaid or remission. Good. So in my mind, I didn't think that whatever, why would that change? You know, right. I'm on a medicine. Right. Like I didn't know that your body could create antibodies to the medicine. So it didn't even cross my mind. Like, yeah. so I just thought, oh, it's this kind of like, you know, some people take insulin the rest of their life. If they have diabetes, I'm just going to take Enbrel and the the rest of my life. No right. worries. And then maybe, yeah, when I have a baby, I want to take it off and at the of course. Right. But, um, and then when my body created antibodies to it, like seven years later, that was such a rude awakening. So right. I was like, no, 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 hold on. I already figured this out. I just take Enbrel. <laughs> like this is not, this is not happening. Something must've been like something inter- I literally thought like my medication must've been like you know, not kept at the right temperature or like something yeah. like, is my refrigerator not working? Like it didn't, I didn't know. Right. It's not me. It's them. No, no, it's not me. The medication didn't fail. I didn't fail the medication. The medication failed me. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's so great. Not having too many expectations and it's just, it's hard to know how to function, how to plan your day right. without expectations. Absolutely. So, um, but to not have, not cling so tightly to them, like, right. and not cling to the idea that one, there's a one size fit all that you just need to find the right person. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people on social media who prey upon people with autoimmune diseases. Exactly. I was just going to say okay, that. Okay, tell me. Yeah. Tell, they, what is your on that? I think it's so sad because when you're in the most vulnerable position of your life, right after this diagnosis, you're like, I don't want to be on these medications, but at the same time, I want to get better. And this person is saying that this diet or this pill or this, whatever cured their RA or cured their lupus or, and I just want to be like, no, because then they, this would be publicized. Everyone would be on it. Right. Like it's, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not a thing. And that's where your healthcare provider is really important. Um, Just doing your research as a consumer of the world is very important, right? Like how accurate is this information out there? Sometimes I'll see stuff and I'll be like, Ooh, that's not gonna, that cleanse is not going to fix your arthritis. I mean, try it, but please be on your embryo as well. No, it's, it's really, it's really tough. Cause I've also, I think there's like a gray area. Like there's the, what there's the, some people who are like truly just charlatans who are like, I know yes. that this is wrong, but I'm going to make money and profit off of people's pain. Mm-hmm. And 
that's like the really black and white part, right? They're not, those are the not good people. But then right. there's the people who have like really good intentions and they think like, because something worked for them, it will work for others. And again, if you have no medical training, you would be like, oh yeah. Right. Like, Let's oh my gosh, shot. like, I'm so excited. Cause I went vegan and my RA went away like, and no one else is <laughs> going or no one else is the, the problem is no one else is teaching patients about, you know, yeah. uh, unless they get referred to a registered dietitian. So right. Um, you can have the best intentions, but not understand like the complexity. Right. And that's where that expectation thing comes in. If your expectations are, you're going to be completely fixed from this. It, you're setting yourself, setting yourself up for failure again, because that's not reality. That's just yeah. not reality. If you look at all the patients together in the world that have arthritis, everyone has a different journey and there's not one fix for everyone. No, no. And it's, it's better to look that reality in the face than mm-hmm. to, spend your whole, you know, this is what I try to teach, tell people is like, you know, you could try to spend your whole life trying to find that silver bullet. That's going to make your rheumatoid arthritis go away. Or you could spend like the limited time you have left, like focusing on functioning the best that you can having the best quality life you can, even with this diagnosis. And it's up to you. Like if it's, if it's meaningful and important to you and you're like, no, I want to find a cure, like a, something that's going to make it go away. And that's, that becomes, uh, something meaningful in your life. But I think it's like, there's this presupposition underneath that to say that I can't have a good life unless this is cured or healed. And that's not true. Right. Right. And I think that is a normal feeling, especially in the beginning after the diagnosis, you're like, why me? Why do I have to have this? I mm-hmm. don't want this, but the truth is it's, it's there. It was diagnosed yeah. and we, we have to fix it. Right. And we'll medicine, we'll try to do everything we can with modern medicine and conventional therapies to get you to a place where you feel like you're living up to your potential. Yeah. I love that. Oh, that's so, that's so good. And then was there anything else before we wrap up that you wanted to touch on or share with the audience? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. It's just, I always like to have that anything else time because like when I'm being interviewed sometimes I'm like, Oh, I didn't get to say that, you know? No, I, I think the biggest thing is changing the mindset from this is my expectation of what's going to happen. I'm going to go from point A to point B to just learning the journey of it, and then also sharing it with others, right? Like, it, I think it's so powerful to be able to be part of support groups and mm-hmm. the Juvenile Arthritis Foundation or the Arthritis Foundation. Uh, it's really important to share your story because it gives hope to others. And that's what's helpful. Yeah. Um, and that's partly why I kind of branched out and did my own thing with starting my own private practice here in Houston yes. is because that is the one message I think anyone with a chronic illness needs to hear is that you can live and thrive, just like you say, with, with this, with a chronic illness, it's just making sure you have the right education, the right support, the right, and you're just being empowered. And that's not going to happen overnight. It is a process. It is a journey, Mm -hmm. but me as a doctor, that's, that is what I'm here to do. And me as a patient, that's what I've learned. So I can doctor you to do that. Right. I love that. I love that. And what's the name of your, I know your, your practice isn't uh, all the way yeah, hasn't started yet, but <laughs> that's right. It's starting in August. So just, okay. what are we like two and a half months away yeah, now? Yeah. Um, it's called room to grow room with R H E U M. You know, I love a room pun. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I ruminated on it for a <laughs> while. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yes. It's room to grow in Houston. And so if you're in Houston and, um, you're interested in having kind of integrative rheumatology approach. I'm happy to see you. That's, that's actually my website is www.room to grow and then TX because it's in Texas. Is it, is it just pediatric rheumatology or is it For now it is okay. um, integrative pediatric rheumatology? And yes. It's integrative pediatric rheumatology. And I have a, um, clinical hypnotist to help with chronic pain. I have a nutritionist. I'll have an Ayurvedic practitioner who does kind of nutrition based on your body type, your personality type. So there's different avenues to kind of make you feel your best. You should get an occupational therapist. I, you know, girl, you need to move here. I know. <laughs> Dude, the weather, the Seattle's having like the wettest spring. Oh, oh it's just, yeah. I would, I, I mean, Houston is definitely sounding appealing, although in general, there's some things about Texas. I don't like. Agree. But, agree. Agree. Yeah. I mean, nowhere's perfect. Nowhere's perfect. But um, I love that. Yeah. No. And I think. Yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome. I'm really. I'm, I'm excited. excited for you. It's the next step, and I I hope to like really make a big impact for these kids coming through the clinic. You know, oh gosh, and it's goodness. not just for kids who have rheumatic illnesses. I can still apply integrative medicine to like ADHD, migraines, back pain. Um, you know, anxiety mm. that 
I can help you with that part as well. I'm not going to be managing your meds, but I can help you. With no, everything and actually, else. <laughs> that's really important for people to understand because you are trained as a pediatrician, and right. then you have an additional specialty in rheumatology. But you could see pediatric clients. You know, yes, um, exactly. sorry, I'm telling you hey, what I think patience. you could do. Patience, <laughs> yeah. patience, patience. Sorry, <laughs> what are we talking about? It's funny in OT, and for some reason, there's like this, like some people call people clients and some call them patients. It's, it's interesting, but yeah, patients. Yeah. Mine are literally, um, literally little people, like little, little clients. Or kiddos <laughs> Or like, yeah, there was this one, there's this long thread on one of these like social media sites of like, should we be calling our patients like kiddos? Because a lot of people are like, oh, I have some kid, like, hey, my kiddo's here. You know, and it's just funny because I, lo- I love pediatrics. That's why I went into Me OT too. to work in like pediatrics, but then now I'm doing, I also love adults. So I guess I just yeah. love everyone, but, um, but yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm getting ready to volunteer this summer at the um, juvenile arthritis the camp oh, in Washington State where fun. I live. Yeah, there's I do it like, um, I mean I've done it every year I could. I did I guess I was gonna say I do it every year, but I don't because they didn't even exist last year. It didn't happen, you know, because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a few times I missed it, but um, but it's just a it's wonderful to you know I think they do connect with the fact that I can say like I'm a patient you know I have yes, arthritis and exactly um and I then, think people are like wait what you're not just giving me advice you've actually lived this advice mm-hmm. you know it's it's totally different you have such street credibility it's <laughs> yeah well and I also know I what I have noticed is as a patient sometimes I'll be like um, saying something like, oh, well, they don't understand. Or this person was, was, you're tempted to say that, right? Like when you know, it's an invisible condition, like I could be talking to, and I actually was, um, I have had a situation where I was talking to somebody who was a doctor that I didn't know also has oh. rheumatoid arthritis, but it was, so I was like, well, you guys don't understand love is this. <laughs> and they're like, actually, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we, we all have to challenge those, like, uh, mental right. errors our brains want to make, which is that, oh, okay, if I don't know that they have RA, even though I'm aware and I tell people all the time, you can't see it, it's in right. this wellness, like, you know, <laughs> you still make those errors, you know? Okay, we're all human. Exactly, self-compassion, <laughs> self-compassion. Yes. And so where can people, I know you have, in addition to the Room to Grow clinic website, you also have some social media. Where can people follow yes. you? So I, I, I'm new to Instagram, okay? So don't judge. No, I, I you are doing have... great. <laughs> My handle is room, R-H-E-U-M, to grow T-X. And I try to spread as much information I can about pediatric rheumatology to help families, especially when they're newly diagnosed, um, not just with arthritis, but your lupus, you know, it's, it's a lot of info to put on there. So mm-hmm. get ready for more. <laughs> yeah. Is there room for more? There is room for more. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't stop it. We're talking about room, like R-H-E-U-M. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Hopefully you know how to spell rheumatology. That's the only way this works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's so funny. Anyway. Um, well, thank you so much. I mean, I know you have limited time just with being so busy setting up your practice and having three kids and <laughs> taking care of yourself. And that's your right. My, no, thank you so much for having me. I hope this has helped at least one person out there to realize that you can have a career and kids and live with this diagnosis. Um, but yeah, yeah thank you. Oh, no. And I, I'm just, I'm just, I hope that your treatment plan I mean, I know that everyone's going to have ups and downs, but I do hope that yours is, becomes a little bit you. um, smoother, right. you know, and not know. maybe quite as many lows <laughs> is what we, we hope for. Right. Right. Um, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, um, don't forget to follow Dr. Singla online <laughs> and I will put all these links in the show notes, but for now I will say bye.